I'm Vinita Gupta. I'm the Director of Action Secretariat, a global health advocacy partnership that consists of 15 locally based civil society organizations across five continents. The Action Partnership is thrilled to host uh, this event. Um, given the urg urgency of the situation and importance of this uh, moment, we brought in really incredible um, women leaders to, to kickstart us on this discussion and we welcome you to also participate actively. So actions partners advocate around the world for political and financial commitments to strengthen health systems, to increase resources, um, to improve policies, to foster health equity and seek accountability from governments and global mechanisms. Um, please do visit action.org to learn more about our work. Women, are, uh, as you know, women and girls are disproportionately affected by conflicts, uh, public health crisis, and other socioeconomic challenges in society. And we also know that women are at the center of, um, of solution too. We have seen in COVID-19 too, how women's leadership has really um, proved to be effective, compassionate, effective, and um, led the countries out of COVID faster than some other countries. Um, this topic is particularly uh, personal to me. I'm a maternal and child health uh, physician and a human rights lawyer. And uh, my own roots are in South Asia, and I've worked deeply for multiple years in overseeing programs and uh, supporting programs in um, Asian countries. I'm grateful to have the honor to chair this session with such important and diverse voices who have their ears to the ground. And you'll see what I mean when you hear them talk. Before we get started, I just want to run through a few logistics things. Um, I highly encourage you to share your comments through the chat. We'll be monitoring it. It's on the right side of your screen. Um, anytime during the presentation, we'll, we'll, as I said, we'll monitor the messages, set aside a time to answer some of the questions that you might pose. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please um, uh, say so in the chat or for everybody, then we'll just throw it to all the panelists. Um, please engage on, um, online, whether it's fa um, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, hashtags we are using is health equity, Afghan women, and women's health. Um, the tag, uh, and then also we have uh, panelists, um, uh, Twitter handles all throughout the chat, and then on, also on the slides, uh, please use them. Um, let's make it dynamic. This event is recorded and will be shared with attendees. And it will, it's also being live streamed. Um, just to recap the main objectives, um, it's, um, as you know, the fallout of Afghanistan has had a deep impact on um, women and children, uh, especially girls, and their access to healthcare. Um, we are exploring what can we as a global health community do, whether it's institutional and the institutional basis, like we are thinking about us as individuals and also as um, action team um, and part of the big consortium of groups working on it. Civil society can do what international mechanisms can do so to ensure the healthcare and to catalyze action and foster collaborations. Uh, without further delay, let me introduce our panelists. Heather Barr, the director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. She has worked on child marriage, girls' education, violence against women, refugee and prisoners' rights, and trafficking, um, including in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Burma, Nepal, and Papua New Guinea. And then Dr. Sadiqa Bashiri. And I'm so glad to be back with Sadiqa and um, uh, Gulali after uh, I think it was 2014 when we were in the same room, and now it's in the Zoom room. So I'm very honored to be back with them. Sadiqa Bashiri transformed an um, abandoned mosque into school, and now years later is the co-founder and board member of Rouge Learning Center, as well as CEO of Rouge Institute of Higher Education. Nagea Chorley, she's CEO of the Results International Australia for more than 20 years experience leading organizations spanning refugee, youth development, and women's rights issues. Uh, Vazna Frog is the peace building expert, lifetime campaigner for uh, Afghan women and girls. Um, 
she, she has over 10 years of meditation and conflict resolution experience. And we're very lucky to have all the panelists and uh, Vasna. Gulali Ismail, founder of uh, Aware Girls. Gulali started as a teenager to work on girls' reproductive rights at the border area of Pakistan and Afghanistan. She later founded Youth Peace Network in Khyber Pakhtunwa province in Pakistan. She had to leave Pakistan and, uh, using dangerous terrain, sometimes on foot, to escape persecution. Uh, Dr. Luwe Pearson, Associate Director of MNCH, Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health at UNICEF. Dr. Pearson has spent past 20 years advocating for women's and children's health, causes in places such as China, Pakistan, Nepal, Ethiopia, Hong Kong, and United States. Welcome everybody, and thank you, thank you for your time and uh, being here today. So we will start with Vazina. Um, she's a peace, as I mentioned, peace, um, women peace and security expert. Wasma, can you uh, talk a little bit about women and uh, with keeping women and girls in mind? What do you see as the greatest security threat in Afghanistan? And what do you see as the greatest opportunity for peace? And also, additionally, if you can share some thoughts on uh, competing challenges between, on one hand, it's the struggle for getting access to healthcare. On the other hand, it's bare, bare minimum survival. People are just trying to stay alive. So how do you how do you um, uh, kind of align that? Although they're not exclusive of each other, but it's a, it's a kind of a, what do you do in such a situation? Mm -hmm. Over to you, Asma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinita. And I'm very much honored to be part of this discussion. Um, and I hope that these conversations continue because the crisis right now in Afghanistan is taking a huge toll on women and children, particularly. So um, I just want to, to set the context, particularly in this conversation, what happened after August 15. And um, of course, uh, we also have to remember that the situation of women and children, women and girls in Afghanistan has not been ideal even before that, right? The mother's mortality rate, for example, 30 um, every 30 minute a mother for example dying from um, 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 pregnancy related complications or for example women's access to health clinics being bombed by the Taliban for example and um, the clinics that were built by international members were politicized you know but they were um, attacked so we already had and, and of course because we already had a war going on and um, they invest meant or the funding to the health care was very, very limited. But what happened after 15th of August, when Kabul um, was Kabul before 15th of August, many other provinces, but then Kabul was taken over um, by the Taliban. So uh, the next day, of course, like, you know, thousands and millions of women um, could not even get out, right? Like doctors, nurses, female members of parliament, people, female ministers, nobody. So the, that was the first kind of, you know, um, the setback that women were like excluded from even being able to get out of home. And then things started to kind of unravel further or black women lost the opportunity to work. Little girls, even grade six above are not able to go to school, for example, right now. And, um, you know, I work with a network of uh, women and local peace builders network in 34 provinces. And we have like 200 women um, and men as our members. And the daily reports that I get and and, and these two months have been and been very very pathetic particularly in terms of women's mobility so the first thing has been women's mobility have been you know hampered drastically even nurses and doctors in the provinces last week i i looked at the reports you know that they cannot go to work one is the salaries of course that they are not being paid and then most importantly that fear of reprisal the fear of revenge many of these women for example who treated uh, the victims of violence who treated for example rape victims women rape victims of sexual abuse for example their perpetrators are after them so i have actually been helping a number of doctors you know if getting evacuation from uh, from Afghanistan and people are asking oh the female doctors are not at risk and and they don't see that you know the security for doctors and and medical personnel is so so much um, complicated as well because they are now facing reprisals remember when the Taliban took over 
all the prisoners were uh, were freed without and and it took us years to put the perpetrators of violence um, you know in jails and 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 indict them or or you know put them into a, the justice system and all of them have been freed women who had you know been raped yeah, like the reports even that we have shows that the perpetrator has now come to uh, you know forcing the family to marry her so things are such you know, have started hampering the, the security and, and women's mobility. It, access has been very much um, the first, uh, you know, challenge, the access to health care. And at the same time, because the the women and um, female members of the health care, um, you know, um, sector is not going to work, then women who are, you know, who were in need of it are not able to access it as well because the families do not allow women to go to a male doctor. So in, in, in the other, you know, setback is the schools, for example, when grade six to 12 are not able to, to go to school, you will not have doctors in the next years. We had at the um, last year of a medical, Kabul Medical University, the last year students who were deprived of doing their final exam. So some hundred female uh, to be doctors are now sitting at home. Uh, these are kind of, you know, dire um, uh, realities on right now, especially from the, the the women who have been in healthcare. Because for now, you hear a lot of uh, media sa saying there are no issues for women in the healthcare. Women doctors and nurses can go to work, but it's very complicated because, the, of course, the access is very much in in mahrams. For example, in Samangat, the female doctors were not able to go to the civil hospital because they did not have mahrams and um, which is a male companion that that should come to with a woman so all of that you know the security has added so much uh, complications for women's access to health care thank you thank you wasma so um as you mentioned the situation was very dire even before right and now it's gotten worse any any thinking like, is there any ray of hope or where, where is it that we need to kind of uh, focus on? Like, it, it's just heartbreaking that um, the women and the young, um, young women and girls who worked so hard to get to the final year of exam uh, to become doctors. One, it's their personal journey. And then second, it is uh, loss to the country today and in future. So anything that you see yeah. as a um, opportunity or a hope well, uh, I hate to say aid uh, have for now has become the only dependent for, for many of our funds. So, you know, like the international aid organizations um, who are helping in the healthcare, you know, there's a lot of hope from, you know, WHO, UNSF, UNFPA and other uh, UN organizations or other international organizations that have been supporting the healthcare, healthcare sector to continue, you know, uh, providing that support, but also providing the support that conditionalizes, you know, the um, engagement and inclusion of the women in the health sector, because it's not just women as doctors, right, or women as nurses, you have women in the health profession, women managers, women in public health, you know, the management of, of health uh, as well. And it makes it very hard if you do not have women in the in the in the sector because the access to the communities we have a very rigid you know um, culturally um, inaccessible um, homes in many parts of the country where the family would not open their door to male doctors male workers male vaccinators for example. So uh, that aid, uh, sadly, um, is one of you know the dependents at this point. That the aid organizations, the money that was pledged to Afghanistan and and you know in Geneva earlier, we heard it's around hundred um, you know a million or a billion of the, uh, dollars. We are not hearing what happened to that, right? Why it's not reaching to Afghan communities? So we need that to be accelerated, um, of course. And, and besides other, you know, food security issues, but at the same time, it's also political. I see healthcare and, and very political as well. So, um, you know, international uh, countries, missions, all these um, foreign missions that keep meeting the Taliban, they do not even include women in their um, delegations. You know, you saw Dr. Tedros from WHO. He was one of the first delegations that visited Taliban. 
and there was no single woman, you know, traveling with him from Geneva. And we were asking him like, you know, are you under the Taliban rule as well? Are you being banned? Um, so why women doctors from WHO are not part of your delegation? That's, that's really, really um, disturbing that mm -hmm. the international organizations are not uh, rather creating a model, a model to follow than following into um, the Taliban's model. So I, let me move to our next uh, panelist, Heather. Um, Heather, what are you hearing and observing in um, Afghanistan from a human rights perspective, particularly uh, regarding um, health rights of women and uh, girls? Is there any ray of hope to hold on to? Thank you so much, and, and thanks for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible task to have to go after Wajma because she's um, like given us a sort of a sprint through all of the issues very quickly. Um, I guess just to add a few thoughts to, to what she's already outlined, which was really helpful. Um, I mean, one of the sad things is that the health sector is, um, is in less trouble than many other areas of women's rights, unfortunately, because I think the Taliban don't fundamentally object to women getting health care. They do a lot of things that make it difficult for women to get health care, but, but they don't actually oppose um, women having access to health care in a way that in the way that they, they do seem to still oppose um, women having access to education and women having access to employment, except in a very narrow way. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing with the health system is playing out against this backdrop where um, you know, the Taliban is, is putting back in place policies that are pretty similar in many ways to what they had in 2001. Um, and, you know, Wajma has already talked about some of the consequences of that. You know, you won't have a pipeline of new health workers if you're not allowing women and girls to study. Um, but I, I wanted to talk for a minute about, about the international community a bit more. Um, because I, I guess I'm part of it <laughs> somehow. Um, and my organization spends a lot of time trying to um, beat up on, on donors and, and other organizations that are part of the international community in Afghanistan. Um, as Wajma said, the, the biggest threat to, the, to women's access to healthcare right now is that the healthcare system is collapsing. Um, and that's because of the actions of the international community. That's because um, this is a system that, you know, is, is part of a government where, you know, a month and a half ago, 75% um, of the funding for the government was coming from international donors. And then that was turned off essentially overnight on, on August 15th. And so I saw that there was a protest today by health workers saying they hadn't been paid in 11 months. Um, we published a report, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but that came out in May that looked at how the healthcare system in Afghanistan had already been devastated by the fact that donor funding to the sector has been falling pretty steadily since 2014 or so. And so, um, you know, these, these new um, blocks in funding come on top of what was already a very, very weakened system. So in terms of hope, I, I hope the international community gets their, gets their act together. And there was news yesterday about UNDP administering a new system to temporarily pay healthcare workers salaries. Um, but I don't think there's been the kind of urgency that there should have been within the international community. And I, I don't think that they have um, seen themselves as responsible for what happens to women in Afghanistan in a way that they should after 20 years of playing such a, a very bossy role in the country. I'll stop, thanks. Thank you, Heather. And it's just um, mind blowing on one hand, uh, they, they do not oppose the healthcare per se. On the other hand, the conditions such as girls like Wazma mentioned before, girls are not being allowed to educate uh, to go to educational um, uh, institutions or complete their medical education. So it's, it's just uh, almost, uh, even though they're not opposed, they're just denying women and girls um, healthcare. So I wanna move to um, Sadika. Uh, so Sadika, what are some of the key social determinants of health at play in Afghanistan under this situation that we are talking about of extreme fragility and then political uncertainty. What do you think some of those key social determinants of health are? Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Vinita. Um, so uh, 
this is a very broad topic, as we know, and, you know, just unpacking this in the context of Afghanistan will take us hours, but to highlight the magnitude of the damage <clears throat> that has already been done to the health system and the aspect that should be looked into to revive the system if there is any political will on the ground in Afghanistan and as well as on um, international community. Uh, from structural point of view, uh, two aspects cannot be overlooked at all. And one is the socioeconomic and political context that we are living in now. And uh, the second is the socioeconomic position of the current government, um, as well as the people of Afghanistan. Uh, because they both are at high stakes right now. Um, and let me explain um, how and why. So if you look at the um, govern governance structure, it is not what the um, international community wants. It is not what the Afghan people support. Although we hear from the Taliban over and over that this is the system, that we are actually the people that are supported by Afghan people, that the Afghan people have fought for this system, for this regime for the past 40 years. That is a one side um, conversation, one side uh, of perspective. But this is, we know that this is not a governance system that is supported by the Afghan people, nor by the international community, and even by the regional actors. So um, this is not an inclusive system. And when we are talking, of, when I <clears throat> particularly am talking about inclusivity, I'm not, uh, and, and specifically uh, when it comes to the health sector, I'm not even referring to the ethnic composition, the Tajiks, Uzbek, Hazaras, and Pashtun. I'm more talking about the expertise in the health sector. So who are the experts and who are the people um, with values and beliefs? And right now we see, you know, we see the cabinet of um, the current government. Um, they all have the same values. They all have the same um, belief system. Uh, there is no expertise uh, when it comes to the health sector. Now, looking at the economic status um, of Afghanistan, again, um, as Bajma um, uh, indicated, and also Heather, the country is at the verge of collapse. Um, you know, World Bank, um, IMF, um, European Union, you know, they have halted all their development projects. And uh, you can see like $9.5 billion. And this is the public money that is frozen in, in banks in America as a way to uh, basically um, sanction the Taliban. But I would say they're sanctioning the people for no good reason. People don't have access to their funds. People, and that has affected the food supply chain. People don't have food. Um, uh, health facilities are running out of health supplies. They don't have medication. And as Wajma said, uh, the, the, the health professionals are not paid for months and they will not be paid. And they see that the current government is not even capable of paying the salaries. So that all brings disappointments into, you know, the, the disappointments that are caused by the um, collapsed economy of the country. Now, looking from the social and public policies perspective, again, there's no policy right now that is in effect. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that we did not have policy, we do, but they are not in effect anymore. And there is no capacity to even revisit those policies. There is no will actually to revisit those policies. And certainly I don't see any expertise uh, for those policies to be revisited. And let's say um, those policies um, will be revisited and um, uh, refined according to the new uh, belief system of the Taliban, but how are they going to be implemented if there is no way to finance them? And uh, finally, um, it's very important to see the um, uh, social and cultural values that are put um, on uh, put on the uh, the the. Um, policies that will be uh, shaped in the future. So um, the importance of policy it values play an, an or enormous role on on um, uh, whether women will be part of those policies, how uh, their health and well-being will be given importance, and whether the system will be gender mainstreamed or not. Although they are saying that you know we want a female. A client, a female patient to be visited by a female doctor or a female health professional. But again, um, these are the people 
who are fearing persecution. These are the people who, are, who have worked with international organizations who were outspoken, who are advocates for the women's rights and the health sector. So again, um, whether those voices will be in the new policies, will, whether the new policies will be shaped by what the Afghan women on the ground want. So right now, the, the, the you know, it's, what we see on the ground it is very grim for women's voices to be part of you know policies and for what women actually want what women actually need um th there's there's a need for a political will within the taliban government and as well as um some ease uh, from the international community side there should exactly. be some kind of accommodation thank you Exactly, and we'll come to the second round of conversation. We'll talk more deeply about it. As you said, it's we cannot even start to begin to peel off the first layer of onion in this conversation, but I hope it will catalyze more interest and people would have more conversations uh, uh, deeper and more in ourselves as well. So like you mentioned, um, World Bank, IMF, and other uh, institutions froze their accounts, and all of them have a policy, a set policy, how to function in fragile or conflict situations. And it's just, it just very unfortunate that when it comes uh, to actually implementing that policy, they just freeze and sit on the fences. So that's one of our calls in the end. We'll talk about call to action in the end. So moving on to Gulali. Gulali, from your own experience working in the region and also through your deep connections, um, what are the, some of the challenges that girls are getting and women are getting access to healthcare, including reproductive health? Any thoughts on addressing um, those questions or whichever other conversation, whichever direction you want to take this conversation? Inviting me, it's really great to be among uh, such eminent speakers. Um, and Vajma has really laid out the conversation when she um, highlighted the most important question that it is expected from Taliban to erase women's and to erase women's identity. But what is happening with international organizations? Why international organizations are erasing women's identity by not including women in their in their delegations? Uh, why international organizations are going in an all men delegation to Afghanistan? Uh, they are uh, playing the role of culprit in erasing identities of Afghan women. Um, and uh, I also want to highlight that we, the women, knew that with a haphazard withdrawal of U.S. military force from Afghanistan, the country will sooner or later collapse and it will become a humanitarian catastrophe. Yet no preparations were made by the international humanitarian organizations. The international organizations tried to, no, sorry, not the international organizations, the international political community tried to sell a false narrative to the women of Afghanistan, telling them that Taliban have changed, they have learned from the past. This was a betrayal to the women of Afghanistan who have suffered war, suffering and insecurity for more than four decades. People of Afghanistan, especially women and children of Afghanistan should not be abandoned. With the healthcare system near to collapse today, a woman in Afghanistan who is about to deliver a child, she does not know where to go for delivery. The safe houses where, who the safe houses have been shut down. And if a woman is becoming victim of abuse, she does not know where to go. Women in refuge of the shelter houses have been sent back to their homes with their abusers. Uh, so they are becoming more vulnerable to the Taliban, this women who are living in shelter houses. The, uh, the, uh, most of the speakers have already mentioned about the withdrawal of the World Bank, uh, uh, World Bank Fund from Afghanistan, uh, but kind of to put it in perspective that the, uh, that the grant that World Bank was giving to, uh, to Afghanistan, it was like 30% of the public spending. And with that funding gone, more than 20, around 20,000 healthcare centers, so around 20,000 healthcare workers have lost their jobs, out of which 7,000 healthcare workers were women, and more than 2,000 clinics have been shut down. So today, people of Afghanistan in generally, and then especially women and children of Afghanistan, they don't have anywhere to go if they need primary healthcare service, if they need secondary healthcare service, they don't have 
uh, anywhere to go. Uh, Wajama has already mentioned and also Heather that even the situation was uh, not uh, for women's healthcare situation was not even um, like a, a very nice situation. Uh, but when uh, when in 1990s Taliban took over Afghanistan, the maternal mortality ratio was 1600 of uh, deaths of women per like 100,000 live births. And the it took millions of dollars. It took thousands of midwives it took uh, it took like 20 years to bring maternal mortality ratio to 600 per 100000 life births so it took it, it it took a lot of efforts of everyone and now with it has been overturned within a night and uh, the and unfp has already given and given their estimates that this current situation could lead to 51,000 additional maternal deaths, 4.8 million unintended pregnancy, and a near doubling of the unmet need of family planning. So I think that um, though, though Heather um, was saying in her, uh, um, in her presentation that uh, healthcare does is kind of like more in the backdrop and there are like other issues, but I think that the healthcare situation in Afghanistan is catastrophic. Uh, when it comes to maternal healthcare, Afghanistan was, uh, the women of Afghanistan were depending on thousands of, mid thousands of midwives. Will these midwives now feel safe to work uh, in the presence of Afghanistan, their life can be, uh, their life can be at risk, um, and also because are is there even money to pay to these uh, women? I think that when the dust settles down, um, we will see that Afghanistan ha would have faced uh, brain drainage, healthcare workers, brilliant minds, people who could have built Afghanistan. None of them would have been left in Pakistan because some of them would have to leave unfortunately to save their lives and the others would have not been let alive by Taliban. So I think that this, the kind of situation, the humanitarian catastrophe that we are facing now, it is going to have a very long lasting impact on Afghanistan and the lives of women. Thank you, thank you Gulali. And um, let's go uh, segue into next, um, sort of deepening the conversation as well. I'll go to Dr. Pearson. Um, so can you, can you share uh, some of the progress that has been made in health of women and children in the recent past? And what progress do we stand to lose if the global aid and support to programs and funding are cut as it is at uh, present uh, being cut? And international organization like yours, UNICEF, uh, how is um, if you planning to continue to make a difference? Can you share some of the work that you're doing currently? And if any challenges you would you are comfortable sharing? Thank you. I will say on the, <clears throat> the situation because many of my um, formal, my panel members have already spoken to the current situation. I'm proud to say that UNICEF stays in Pakistan and we continue to deliver. Our presence is not just in Kabul, but in 13 field offices. We are aware there are the interruption of services, but we are also there to build it back. After the interruption of the World Bank and the IMF project, I hope it is a temporary, UNICEF, WHO, UNDP, and um, other partners are taking temporary measures. We are increasing the mobile health teams. We are provide expanding our support to cold chain. Right, UNICEF is we're famous for our immunization and the cold chain support. Every one out of two doses of immunization for children every day, every year in every country goes through UNICEF system. So we are expanding the code chain to hospital support, additional fuels when there is no electricity to keep newborn work going so that sick and small children could continue to, to receive care. We understand the importance of keeping healthcare providers, female staff included paid so that they continue to 
provide essential health services. And UNICEF, just as we speak, is sending in tons of essential medicines to the country, nutrition supplies, antibiotics, and uh, water and sanitation, uh, infection prevention control. These are really very important. Myself, I have been to Afghanistan before COVID. I went to Hirat. I was in different hospitals around Kabul. We have, I have seen how resourceful Afghan women are, right? And I think the future will be in, in their hand and uh, in their children's hand for the brighter future of Af Afghanistan. And UNICEF is proud to be part of the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, going back to keeping the same conversation rolling, I want to go to Nagaya, CEO of Action uh, Partner Results International Australia. Um, Nagaya, what are most um, concern? What most concerns you about the situation in Gaza, Afghanistan, when it comes to children's routine immunization services, especially the polio vaccine? I know that. Um, Australia, Results Australia is running a big campaign on polio this month. Um, and I want to hear your thoughts on what concerns you most. And having worked with women all over the world, what are some of the gravest impacts of sidelining women's needs in relation to healthcare and broader economic, socioeconomic landscape? And what are the benefits of um, and opportunities for elevating their voices? Over to you, Nadia. Thank you. So thank you so much, Vinita. Firstly, just to say thank you so much for convening this really important conversation with these amazing panelists. So I really appreciate your work and the work of action uh, more broadly. Um, I'm assuming we've got a, a global health audience. And of course, as, as we all know, immunizations are one of the most cost effective interventions we can make um, in the public health space. Um, and of course, they play such a key role in enabling children to survive and ultimately to thrive. Um, and they've really helped shape modern history. So I, I can't underline enough the importance of, of vaccines more broadly. Um, so of course, you know, we're always concerned with when there's any threat to vaccine campaigns um, through conflict or instability. And of course, we're seeing that in dramatic form in Afghanistan at the moment. But on top of that, um, as you mentioned, Vinita, Afghanistan's a particularly interesting country when it comes to polio. Um, people may be aware that, you know, historically up to a thousand children every single day worldwide um, were paralysed from polio. And of course, in the 1980s, a, a group of actors came together, the World Health Organization, Rotary, UNICEF and others, and, and formed the, glo the Global Polio um, Eradication Initiative, which, you know, had an incredibly ambitious aim and still does to wipe out polio um, from the face of the earth. Um, and of course, the initiative has been incredibly successful. Um, incident rates have gone down by 99%. Um, but the only two countries left on earth that still have um, the wild polio virus are, of course, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So um, we always have been worried, of course, about Afghanistan um, uh, when it comes to polio um, and the importance of a really comprehensive uh, vaccine program. Um, but of course, the concern around Afghanistan has gone up since the Taliban seized control in mid-August of this year. Um, I was really um, pleased to hear what Heather was saying, some, some pretty encouraging things around the Taliban and, and kind of their commitment to health more broadly. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to vaccines, their, their record is, is, of course, quite mixed. Um, 20 years ago, they were broadly supportive um, of vaccine campaigns. But of course, we know about, I think, two or three years ago, um, they stopped um, people delivering vaccines in certain parts of Afghanistan that they were controlling. So a fairly mixed record. Um, but then on top of that, as, as we've heard from other panelists today, um, of course, there can't be any effective, effective um, vaccine campaign without women. Um, women are, are absolutely core to the health workforce um, in Afghanistan. So getting women back to work um, to really deliver those vaccines is, is critically important. And of course, ensuring safe access and safe roads and all of that is, is important too. Um, so yeah, we are concerned and absolutely results and, and action globally have been doing a lot of work historically around um, polio in particular. So really keen to see you know, what unfolds um, in Afghanistan over coming months and what the Taliban's position will be um, on, on vaccines uh, more broadly. 
Um, ideally, of course, vaccines transcend politics, but, um, but of course, it's an incredibly complex environment. So if um, the Taliban are not supported, it's obviously going to have you know, significant um, health security impacts for the region. Did you want me to go on, Vinita, and, and talk about, about women being sidelined? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, we can also go to the next round. Thank you for checking, Nagar. Um, uh, we have one panelist that will need to leave soon. So I was wondering if we can get her thoughts on um, before she has to go. Uh, Wazma, I'll come to you um, with my second round of questions that we were thinking about. First of all, thank you everybody for sharing your insights and there will be some more discussion later. Um, I was wondering, uh, Vasma, if you can uh, share some of your thoughts on what, um, what can international community do, whether it's at the individual level, whether it's an organization level, small or big, or the uh, big players, big global mechanisms, anywhere you want to start or finish is uh, very valuable. Over to you, Vasma. Thank you, Vinita. Well, you know, right now the situation is as dire as like on daily basis, we try to, you know, send some money to our staff, our partners on the ground so that they can buy bread. Buying, you know, 15 apps bread is a luxury right now for so many people in Afghanistan. And this is because people have lost their income and they, they, they don't have jobs, they don't have salaries and the banks have been closed. So people who had even their salaries, you know, transferred, like for, we, we tried to transfer, you know, at least three months advance salary of our staff and many other of our partners, but then none of them can actually take that money from the bank all of our you know accounts all of that are frozen uh, frozen inside Afghanistan so literally we are sending people the money to buy bread so on an individual basis I think in uh, finding donations connect, collecting donations and sending it to the people you know in Afghanistan would be the first thing at the same time people you know, for women and girls who are part of different networks we connect with, even now top up card for their phones is a big thing. Like they, they are not able to buy top up for, uh, cards for their phones. So phone credit, like we, there is a, an, a, um, an online uh, website where we use and, and top up people's numbers. So if you know Afghans inside Afghanistan, if you know, you know, individuals, families, you know, that would be big help. The other thing, of course, then comes the bigger part, like, as I was saying before as well, like this, we were very much, um, you know, delighted to hear that, okay, this $1 billion is coming to Afghanistan, it will change this humanitarian crisis, right? But what happened to that after a month, you're not even hearing, where's that money? You know, that money needs to go to Afghanistan, to the Afghan people, this needs to pay, pay the salary of teachers, the doctors, you know, the, the government staff, there are 2 million um, Afghans as part of the civil service. And um, so they need salaries, the universities and uh, teachers, etc. So the salaries is like th that money has to come to Afghans that has been pledged actually. So, um, and, you know, this is SRSG the, and also the UN um, Secretary General uh, was announcing this with so much, you know, um, uh, happiness that yes, we got this much money, but where is that money, right? The other thing, of course, is that Afghanistan's um, assets um, needs to be frozen, uh, which has been frozen, needs to be unfrozen, but it shouldn't happen like unconditionally. The Taliban are asking, there is a leverage that the world has on the Taliban. The Taliban are asking for aid, the Taliban are asking for recognition, the Taliban are asking for political engagement. In all of that, so if they want to be part of the international system, they have to comply with the international regulation. It's as simple as that. So if I am, for example, you know, the ambassador or foreign minister of Germany, and I'm meeting, for example, the Taliban, and when they are asking me for money, and I clearly say, you know what, these are the international rules, you know, that you need to abide by these. And, and, and I know the Taliban are not in a, in a situation or not in capacity to rule. They have been fighting an insurgency. They are not government. They have not had any, um, you know, experience in government. And, and what they have also done is that they excluded all the previous government technocrats and people who were, you know, civil servants. 
So they don't know how to run the government. They need expertise. They need, you know, skilled ones, um, as well as skilled international experts, you know, so that they could help them. And all of this needs to be negotiated. You know, they, this has to be negotiated. This, all these meetings that happen with the Taliban leadership in Afghanistan need to have those outcomes clearly. And because the Taliban are asking for money, they are asking for aid, they are asking for recognition. So, you know, the, the, the right to negotiation is that you give something, you take something, right? So what if you're asking the international community for money, for aid, for recognition, for political engagement, open your embassies, let your, uh, you know, missions to come and work in Afghanistan, then what is it that the Taliban needs to do? So that is not being happening. And, 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 that, and, and I think, you know, the world um, uh, leaders who are engaging with Taliban, including their foreign ministers, they need to talk to Afghan women um, and who can actually tell them how to do these. Um, and we have done this like for years, you know, we negotiated, uh, we bargained, you know, little, little um, progress or steps. And even right now, many women in Afghanistan have started that. So the advocacy needs to continue, but people who can, you know, like donations are needed and the, and the pressure on the aid organizations so that money which has been pledged to Afghans, this needs to come to Afghans, actually. Thank you so much, Wazma. And um, the key message is for the audience and to share when they go back to their organizations or through their social media, is whichever way they can put pressure on the international um, com, uh, global mechanisms or their governments or uh, to, to negotiate a better situation for women and children in Afghanistan before they give any perks to them. And, and, so, and include that, sorry, and include Afghan women in your conversations. You know, if for example, if WHO is talking to the Taliban, they need to include women doctors in, in there, you know, and, uh, from Afghanistan as well, who can actually be present. So physical presence is as important at this point as the continued advocacy. Absolutely, absolutely. And now let's go to Sadiqa with the same question. Sadiqa, um, what can the international community do? And please feel free to um reinforce what Wadma said something new whatever wherever direction you want to talk about what can we all do in our individual capacity and part of the organizations or part of this global community to help alleviate the situation well thank you so much uh, anita uh, and i'm so glad Wajma highlighted some very very important points uh, particularly um, the commitment that the international community um, is showing that they are not going to abandon Afghanistan and going to, uh, you know, uh, provide the help that is needed and uh, uh, and uh, basically save Afghanistan from becoming a humanita uh, the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. But again, we want the talk to basically walk. Um, it is only talk the talk we want the action to be seen and we don't have a lot of time um basically time is running out um the winter is uh, around the corner uh, we still have uh, thousands of people displaced uh, from uh, you know those who have left uh, their uh, homes um, in uh, pro provinces they are still in Kabul in different parks in tents living in tents uh, they don't have um, access to uh, basic needs um, as Wajma said uh, you know bread a piece of bread is a luxury. So in, in, in a time of crisis like this, we cannot afford talking. It's time to really for international community to take an action. And again, we want the, the Afghan assets, uh, the Afghan's money to be um, unfrozen. Again, I'm saying, uh, I mean, this, this should be said a million times if needed, billion times if needed, that it should not be unconditional. Um, the, the U.S. played a very, very poor role in, uh, you know, having signing um, the Doha agreement with the Taliban where there was no um, the presence of women. This, that actually allowed, or a very slim to none presence of women, 
that allowed the Taliban to do what they are doing right now. And WHO delegation with no women, that they, that's a very, fall, um, a very false um, role model that they are presenting to the Taliban. So what is important right now at the national level, it should be the uh, social cohesion and social capital put in place. So we have, uh, we have professional, uh, health professionals and professional in all sectors that includes men and women. We have women as mothers. We have women as uh, they're basically running the houses. We have women community leaders who have who were uh, running um, shoras, the, the, the councils. So they all should be part of, you know, what should be, what should happen next. They all should be part of identifying the, the current needs, the current needs, and also they should be part of basically uh, the solution. Now, for this to happen, well, we, we were actually, we women advocates have been advocating for women to be um, in, in position, uh, in decision-making roles they should be at the table anytime the conversations are made, anytime the decisions are made. But uh, I mean, that was a step where we saw ourselves growing. Now with the Taliban, there's a whole setback. Who can play a role in um, basically giving leverage to the advocacy efforts that we were doing before the Taliban time, and that is needed now is the international community. So there is a need for the, that pressure. We, okay, if the, the Taliban, they know that they cannot survive without having good relationship with the international partners. They cannot survive, their government cannot survive if they are not funded by the international community. So for that assistance to come, the international community should say, we want women professionals to be talking to us. Like, clear, we want women to talk to us. We want at the Ministry of um, Health, we want women to talk to us. At the mis Ministry of um, Education, we want, okay, you don't have women ministers, but there should be women in the conversation. So that is very, very important. At the same time, it's very important for the, uh, the international partners, um, I mean, the civil society sector and uh, the, the, the nonprofit organization, the women activists all over the world to basically pressure their government that one, uh, we cannot let Afghanistan um, to be, uh, to preserve the status quo that it is right now for the past 50 days, um, well, now about two months. They cannot afford this because Afghan people cannot afford this. And also that they should pressure their government that no talk will be made without the condition of international community and the conditions that people from Afghanistan or women in Afghanistan want to be respected. So that is a very simple. Um, basically, they need uh, the, the support of the international community and the international community should just make sure that the people, the, the, the people of Afghanistan are heard and also um, what women want internationally for uh, the women in Afghanistan and also for the Afghan people, that should be echoed. Thank you so much, Sadika. As we all know that it's not possible to cover everything that can be done and that's happening in this short conversation, but at least it catalyzes all of us um, listeners to think about it more and engage more. So I'm gonna go next to Heather with the same question, Heather, what can we do? Um, thank you. So I wanna talk really quickly about um, three things. First of all, voting in the Human Rights Council um, on a resolution about Afghanistan is happening maybe right at this moment. Um, the session started, the voting session started about an hour ago. Um, and there's a proposal that's being voted on to have a special rapporteur on human rights in Afghanistan. Um, this is actually not as strong as what we thought was needed my organization and many others were actually advocating for a fact-finding mission by the United Nations, which would have been a stronger mechanism. Um, but a special rapporteur would still be an important step. And it is clear from the proposal that it would include a focus on violations of the rights of women and girls. So we should push for that to happen. Hopefully it will happen today. And once, it, if it is voted um, into place, then we should be pushing hard for that to get up and running quickly and to have a really robust capacity and focus 
on women and girls. Second, um, the UNAMA mandate, the UN mission in Afghanistan, um, its mandate was extended for six months in mid-September. UNAMA in the past has done quite a lot of human rights monitoring. Right now, they're a bit in disarray with a lot of their staff outside the country, but we should be pushing for them to get back in the country um, and to make human rights monitoring a, a big priority, including monitoring the, the functioning of the healthcare system and women's access to healthcare. And then the last thing I wanted to say is just on this topic of foreign organizations meeting with the Taliban without women, um, I fell down a little bit of a rabbit hole on this this morning and started actually looking. And it's easy to look because the Taliban is posting photographs of many of these meetings. And so I wanted to actually name some of the countries and organizations in addition to, I actually didn't know about WHO, that's interesting, I'm going to add them to my list. But um, um, the Aga Khan Development Network, so these are organizations that have had all men meetings with the Taliban in recent weeks, um, International Federation of the Red Crescent, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, a Turkish humanitarian organization called IAHH, um, and UNICEF, actually, I was surprised to see um, Shahrazad Akbar, the head of the Afghanistan Human Rights Commission, flagged that um, UNICEF recently had an all-male meeting with the Taliban. And then in terms of countries, it's a long list. Um, China, Russia, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Qatar, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, the UK, and Malaysia. Um, so I think that it's valuable to track this and to point out that this is unacceptable. Thank you so much. That is so uh, hugely helpful. And please, um, all the participants' handles are in the chat. Uh, we have posted them many times. And if um, Heather mentioned a couple of things that are happening right now, please follow her and her organization to keep yourself updated. And also, if they have any call to action, to jump on it and support uh, call to action if that calls to your heart. Um, so I want to go next to um, Lu Wei to talk about the same thing. What do you think we can all do? And plus anything else you want to bring from uh, UNICEF's perspective? Over to you. Thank you. At the moment, UNICEF, because we're on the ground, right? In certain field offices, locations, we want to make sure the access is maintained, the, the peace corridor. And we want to prioritize on addressing immediate health needs and uh, provide mechanisms to maintaining the Sahat Mandi project that used to be funded by the World Bank. We're looking at one month, three months extension and uh, stop measures before we find a longer term solution. And we are stepping up our effort in advocacy for girls' education, both primary and the secondary and the investment in safe water supplies, treatment of malnutrition, and the tackling child protection and gender issues. So UNICEF is active in Pakistan, sorry, Afghanistan and neighboring countries, Pakistan and others that are receiving refugees from and people moving across the borders and inside Afghanistan. Please support us. So we, our capacity in the country is maintained to continue to deliver for women and children. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a UNICEF Health um, handle also. Please do uh, thank, uh, I would encourage people to thank for their hard work and sustaining um, their services through this challenging time. Thank you. So next, I think we'll go to uh, um, Gulali. Gulali, with the same question, um, what do you think we can all do? Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Vineda. First of all, I want to say that the world needs to recognize that what happened to Afghanistan was a terrorist coup, and it should be dealt like a terrorist coup. Taliban do not represent the people of Afghanistan. They do not represent the aspirations of the people of Afghanistan. There were an elections a year ago in Afghanistan, and a people of Afghanistan used their right to vote to elect the people they wanted to see in the government. So first of all, do not treat Taliban as legitimate leaders of Afghanistan. Do not treat them as legitimate representatives of Pakistan. They are not. They are terrorists that period, full stop. 
And uh, uh, second, what I wanted to thank Heather for uh, calling out organizations uh, who have been taking, uh, going in a full male delegation to Afghanistan, especially uh, for naming and calling out humanitarian organizations, because one of the principles of humanitarianism that is kind of like we are told again and again that one of the main principle according to the international humanitarian law is that these organizations have to be neutral so if you are taking an all men delegation it means you are not neutral you are already acting political and this is violation of the international humanitarian law and i think there should be some kind of accountability for those international humanitarian organizations. We just do not need like accountability for Taliban. These international humanitarian organizations also need accountability for breaking their own principles of impartiality and neutrality. Because, the, because not taking women into the delegation means, uh, of course, it, is, it means erasing women's identity. It's a political action. It's not an apolitical neutral action. Um, then another thing that I wanted to highlight is that um, the international organizations and community really need to advocate with the neighboring countries of Afghanistan to open their borders for refugees and with UNHCR to set up refugee scam camps. Uh, people can from Afghanistan, they can come to Pakistan, but only if they have visa and if they have uh, a letter from the Interior Ministry of Pakistan, it's not like really open for refugees. And we know that with the drought in Afghanistan, with the food scarcity in Afghanistan and with healthcare situation and with the threats to the life of the people, we really need to push for setting up refugee camps so that people can save their lives. And if they need to move out, they could, they, they are able to, um, to move out. Uh, the fourth thing that I wanted to highlight is that yes, already mentioned that uh, Taliban do not have, uh, Afghanistan was uh, uh, mostly dependent on international aid for running public uh, sector, for running healthcare, education. So with, uh, uh, with stopping uh, aid all of a sudden, Af Afghanistan is at the verge of collapse and Taliban do not have those kind of resources to replace the international aid. However, I think it's uh, kind of like, um, it's a very, uh, um, we international organizations have to find ways to provide support to the people, uh, to run the hospitals in Afghanistan, to clinic healthcare centers, but that money should not like land up in the accounts of Taliban organization. We should not be financially strengthening Taliban, we should be focusing, the international community have to really focus on the people of Afghanistan. Uh, Taliban are terrorists and uh, uh, people of Afghanistan should not be sanctioned. They should be provided support, but Taliban should stay sanctioned because they're terrorists and we uh, we don't want them to represent women, Pashtun women, Afghan women. They don't represent us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gulali. Thank you so much. And with the same um, questions, we go to Nagaya. Uh, to share her thoughts on what can be all of us do. Over to yeah, you. I mean, I, thank you so much, Vanita. I, I can certainly talk from the Australian perspective in the sense of what the aid and development sector have been calling on the Australian government to do when it comes to Afghanistan. And this has been based on recommendations from Afghan people living in Australia. Um, but I've got to say, this conversation today is really deep in my understanding, and I'll make sure it's fed back to, to other partners. Um, in Australia that are advocating on, on these issues. So, I mean, the main thing we're doing is really reinforcing to our government that we're a signatory to the UN responsibility to protect principle. So we have a responsibility as Australians, as an Australian government to protect and fight for the health and human rights of the people of Afghanistan. And of course, as we've, we've been talking about today, particularly uh, the women and girls of Afghanistan. So we're called calling in Australia for four things um, and, and it's reinforcing to have heard this conversation today because it, I think it, we, we might be on the right track in Australia um, but we're certainly calling for unfettered access for medical and humanitarian relief um, to those displaced populations both of course inside Afghanistan but also in neighbouring countries um, and then of course we know the overwhelming majority are women so um, getting that humanitarian relief urgently is, is an absolute priority. Um, we also believe that the Australian government needs to be an advocate for women uh, and girls in Afghanistan. Um, of course, um, as ratified with, with CEDAW, and of course, Afghanistan also once ratified CEDAW, but, you know, particularly looking at issues around access to education, um, continued employment, 
um, ensuring, it, especially those health workers, we're in the midst of a, a global health crisis, so ensuring those health workers are back at work, are being paid, that they have the resources they need to, to operate effectively, and really ensuring that women are in decision-making roles. And it's been fabulous just hearing about even the visibility of women and, and all of us being mindful of that, even in our, in our own work, um, is so important. But ensuring that women have decision-making roles, not just in government, but in civil society and NGOs, um, thirdly, we're also calling for an increase in ODA. Um, our ODA has actually gone down, which is really disappointing given our involvement in the war in Afghanistan. Um, it's about, we have bilateral commitment of about 50 million. Uh, five years ago, it was 150 million. So we need to be really um, increasing our ODA commitment at the moment. And as other people have said today, including through big INGOs who are operating effectively um, in country, uh, if need be, and then finally, Australia, like many other OECD countries, has significant capacity to take on board more people from Afghanistan that are at, they're at um, grave risk. Um, we've only taken on 3,000 people, uh, which is extremely disappointing. So there's a need to really um, take on more people. And of course, uh, I think so many people in Afghanistan uh, would, would appreciate that. So that, that's from the Australian um, perspective, Benita. Thank you, thank you. And we did post some, um some information on the chat, Action uh, posted some information about Sehet Mandi project and how it has been funded by the uh, international organization, how it is under rest. And then we are also risk. And then also we have a call to action on how you can make a difference to have that um, huge resource release that we at Action Secretary are trying to uh, mobilize support for. Um, so thank you, Nagaya, for that and uh, all the panelists, I just want to reinforce some of the things that we have talked about. The current situation is wasn't even um, good before August, but it's worsened so much that it's a it's become a conflict to be just uh, be able to breathe and to have access to health care. And they are not separate from each other. But at the same time, what do people do when they're struggling um, inside and the AIDS communic aid communication and the international community outside. They, and this is a strong argument coming from the chat as well, is that how the neutral bodies that are supposed to be neutral, but they're not being neutral. They are actually, for example, um, kind of a, a sort of sitting silent uh, in face of women's representation. For example, WHO's delegation. Women need to be engaged, right? Women need to be seen. All these organization, um, international community and the aid organization not need to change their own, um, own um, working to, to accommodate Taliban's viewpoint. They don't need to silence the women within their organization to oblige Taliban. So that sends a very, very strong, wrong message. And also we heard some of the really good um, call to actions what we are going to do as um, our team, we are going to put together some of the call to actions that you shared with uh, us. And, and during this uh, past one and, um, uh, quarter hour and put it through the social media and tag all of you on it so that we can, we can amplify that message and give people options to engage with any call, out, call to action that works with them. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I just want to throw it open to uh, the panelists if they have seen some communication conversation in the chat they want to react to, or any broader uh, thing uh, for the for the panelists. Just an open floor for the panelists. Uh, Venita, I just wanted to bring up you know, one um, issue which is very much I believe is important, and we uh, did not talk about is the importance of mental health. Uh, because in crisis, mental health is the one thing, I mean, uh, uh, as long as uh, mental health and physical health, they both are important, but mental health for the first time ever, I see that like talking with my students, there are hundreds and talking with my colleagues um, at uh, Rooch Institute of Higher Education, talking with my own family and talking with my own siblings in Kabul. This is the first time ever that I see mental health uh, as an issue brought up to me, that how it has been affecting everyone. It is affecting um, uh, youngsters, it's affecting women, it's affecting men in the house. 
so th this is one of the things like um, when it comes to um, international support and especially international organizations um, uh, helping the health sector in Afghanistan, this is one of the things that I would really, really want them to know that this is a service that is highly needed in Afghanistan. This was needed in Afghanistan. Now, I don't remember the exact um, study that I could quote from, but I uh, had studied that there was like 97 over 97 percent of the people in Afghanistan need some kind of mental health attention so 97 percent now imagine with um during COVID-19 the entire world has been impacted and mental health has been becoming a very important topic um, all over the world. But um, uh, yes, COVID-19 plus the crisis, plus the uncertainty in Afghanistan is actually drawing so much need to this um, uh, to this topic. So I would really appreciate if um, international organizations that are working in the health sector do uh, think about um, mental health services in Afghanistan. Thank you, Sadiqa. Any other panelists, um, if they want to bring up any other issue that we haven't talked about? Yeah, or, I, yeah, yeah, I want to highlight one issue, and uh, that is the safety of civil society organizations, local organizations in Afghanistan that really need to be ad advocated, negotiated with the uh, Taliban on the uh, urgent basis because the healthcare services were mostly provided in Afghanistan by local actors, by local organizations, women and local organizations who would be able to go door to door. And they were the one, they were the forefront of the uh, healthcare system of Afghanistan. And now though, of, though Taliban had uh, kind of like given guarantees that they will give amnesty to the government officers, people who had been working with NGOs or international community. Uh, but we have seen that uh, Taliban are actually targeting again uh, those actors who had some kind of role in Afghanistan. So the safety and security of civil society organizations really need uh, to be advocated so that the, the civil society can thrive, uh, uh, so that the civil society can thrive. Like I was, uh, when I was getting ready for uh, for this webinar, I was just going through um, an article in Guardian, and uh, I came across the story of uh, Afga an Afghan woman police officer. I would like to share that story uh, because it, when I read it, it ripped my heart. This is the a story of one of the four police officers, uh, women police officers who have been killed by Taliban. And uh, the Guardian article said that Negar Masumi, a female police officer with 15 years of experience, was determined not to flee when the Taliban took control of her home province of Gore in central Afghanistan. On Saturday night, gunmen who called themselves Taliban stormed Negar's home. They took her husband and four of her sons in another room and tied them up. Then they beat Negar with their guns and shot her dead. Negar, who was eight months pregnant, could not believe she would be killed because of her job. She had not listened to the warning of her families. And this is not just the story of Negar. This is the story of many other people in Afghanistan who had been contributing to rebuilding Afghanistan. So their safety, their protection should also be a priority for the international community. Thank you, Glali. In, indeed, heartbreaking stories. And um, as you said, it's not just Nagar's story, but so many other playing out um, every minute. Um, I still want to ask other panelists if somebody wants to add to anything. Okay. Um, so I think that moving uh, on to just recapping, one, I want to thank you, everybody, for um, sharing their deep thoughts, the participants being there uh, and listening, and I hope they would engage more deeply. Um, we do know that international organizations need to find a way to support Afghan people, not Taliban, but support Afghan people. The money needs to be directed through um, such means that it reaches the people. And currently the international aid funds are being frozen and it deeply hurts the Afghan people. So they need to find ways, whether leveraging their um, uh, handle on the resources to um, Taliban to agree to some at least basic minimum uh, to allow women to work, get access to healthcare, or have a uh, basic human rights uh, pathway. 
uh, women not only need the access to healthcare, but the healthcare, women healthcare worker needs to be allowed to work and operate. It, it's just not possible that uh, women can have healthcare, but uh, cannot have education. And women need to be working in health sector. It, you know, it's, um, they cannot be educated as doctors, but only way women can get healthcare is through women doctors and healthcare providers. So this just doesn't compute. So it is, uh, all these problems are, are uh, intersecting and the solutions are intersecting too. So I hope, I hope that um, we have been able to um, encourage and inspire people uh, through this conversation, plus through follow-up conversations that we are going to continue to have, to, to collaborate, to catalyze wherever they are in small or big way, wherever and howsoever they can do that. So with that, I just want to thank you so much for all the sharing that panelists had. And uh, for a minute, I'm going to open the uh, open the forum for everybody to unmute themselves so that we can say um, bye to each other and also take uh, probably in the Zoom world, take a self, um, take a screenshot. Uh, if people are comfortable with that, they can put themselves on the video. If they're not, then they can just keep their video off. Thank you, thank you so much. We, it just means a lot to us to be able to convene this meeting. Thank you. If people can unmute themselves and say, uh, goodbyes and also be on the video so that we can take a screenshot. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this today. It was really informative and, and important. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, please uh, feel free to chime in. We have a few minutes, a couple of minutes. If anybody wants to say hello, bye. Hello, um, thank you for uh, this meeting today. It's very informative. Um, I hope uh, we can help women worldwide um, by addressing some thank of the issues here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hello, thank you. Thank you, thank you a lot for this uh, information that deepens my understanding. This is Joyce from Kenya and I'm praying for Afghanistan that all will go well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to connect with you through social media and stay in touch. Bye-bye.